Mr Speaker, thank you, and thank you to members of the Youth Parliament. Mr Speaker, I think you and I would probably both agree that the initial greetings that we have received are a, a, a welcome contrast from what is at, at times the reception that we may get from our, from our colleagues here during normal working sessions. Um, but I wanted to say first that it is appropriate that this session should take place on Armistice Day. Here in Westminster we remember not just those who died, but also the importance of the values of Parliament, the principles of a democratic and free society for which they made that sacrifice. And the shields that you see at either end of this chamber have been inscribed to recall the names of those members of the House of Commons who fell during the First and Second World Wars, along with those who in more recent years were murdered by terrorists who also sought to attack the democratic values and institutions of this country. Those principles of democracy, debate, tolerance and accountability unite members from all political parties on both sides of this House. And as leader of the House of Commons, part of my role is to reaffirm and uphold those ideals. And I wanted to explain, Mr Speaker, to colleagues here a little bit about my job, because it has two parts. It is in part representing the government in Parliament, where I sit as a member of Theresa May's Cabinet, and I am in charge of managing the government's annual legislative programme, but also representing Parliament in Cabinet and in government as a whole. And this, this notion sometimes comes as a surprise to those who might think that Parliament and government are essentially the same thing. After all, under our constitutional system, the government stands on its ability to command a majority here in the House of Commons. And if it was not for that majority, my task of trying to deliver the government's legislative agenda would be a great deal more challenging. But for a parliament to matter, for a parliament to play its full role, a distinctive role in public life, it is essential that it is able to operate as a strong independent institution in its own right. And this chamber has been performing that function for hundreds of years. The scrutiny of legislation by members, their questions every day to ministers, the work of inquiry by the select committees of the House results in, we hope, better and more accountable government and certainly better quality legislation. That oversight work, that scrutiny by Parliament, underpins the concept of ministerial accountability. That in the British system, ministers who are themselves members of the legislature also have to come and they have to stand at this dispatch box or at the table in a select committee and be questioned and held to account for the decisions that they have taken as part of the executive. And thanks to you, Mr. Speaker, the increased use of the urgent question has made Parliament even more responsive to the most pressing matters of the day, even though it occasionally causes a certain amount of uh, discomfort to ministers when they're summoned here at short notice. And whether on policy or on oversight, Parliament's ability to reflect the concerns and interests of British citizens depends on its status as a representative institution. This House has a proud history of ensuring that the voices of marginalised and socially excluded groups are heard and reflected in public debates. And it is probably a little known part of the routines of pretty well every member of parliament, regardless of party, regardless of the part of the country which they represent, that their work brings them into contact week by week, usually in their constituency surgeries, with people from every part of our society, and that we in that constituency work have to confront head-on those who are the victims of injustice, or those who feel that society in some way 
is not working for them. And as Leader of the House, I think that tradition of, uh, of Parliament is something which it is of vital importance that we uphold and which the Government too must support. Our objective must be nothing short of trying to build a democracy that works for everyone. And critical to that objective is ensuring that the voices of young people and their interests are heard loud and clear. And that is why the Government not only supports the Youth Parliament in its mission, but also takes an interest in the subjects which you choose to debate. Previously, the Youth Parliament's members have debated issues such as mental health, the living wage and exam resets. And these are all extremely important questions. And so too are the issues you will be debating later. And I will be particularly interested to hear, when I, I read the, the accounts of, of today's debates, uh, your uh, consideration of how we might seek to build a better, kinder democracy, to take the wording um, uh, that you will be debating later on. So my message to colleagues from the Youth Parliament is that just as the Government is committed to engaging with Parliament, so it takes and will continue to take a great interest in the work of the Youth Parliament too. And that's why it is significant and right that the annual sitting takes place where we are right now. This chamber is the heart of the United Kingdom's parliamentary democracy. And the fact that these debates take place here sends a signal about the importance of the youth, UK Youth Parliament, both to parliamentarians and to the government. It means that both MPs here in the House and ministers in Whitehall will be listening to hear what you have to say. I hope you will go away from today not only having enjoyed and relished the experience, but also with a sense that you will feel confident about communicating to your colleagues and contemporaries that this is their parliament as much as it is the parliament of me or my colleagues in government of Valerie or her, her colleagues in the opposition or even of you, Mr Speaker. Um, it is the parliament of young people as much as of anyone else. This is still the place where you can seek to change this country and this society in the way that you think it needs to be changed for the better. And of course there will be many different ideas, contested ideas, about what change for the better actually means. That's what the democratic debate is all about. But too often in the United Kingdom the voice of young people is absent. And when the voice of young and the vote of young people is absent, decisions are still taken which affect young people's lives but which they have not always chosen in significant numbers to help shape even if the opportunities were there. So I hope that you will take that message back, that this is a parliament for you, for all young men and women in this country. Seize those opportunities, enjoy today and help us build that better, more vibrant democracy which those of us here on both sides of the House, even if we're a bit long in the tooth today, also long to see. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Laurent Omar to come forward and to read a message from the Prime Minister. Thank you, fellow MYPs. I'm from the London Borough of Ealing. Um, I would like to welcome you to the House of Commons and to the UK Youth Parliament. Congratulations to you all for your fantastic achievement in this year's Make Your Mark ballot. I understand that just under one million votes were cast. I know that this represents another year-on-year -year increase in the number of young people voting, and this is great to see. Thank you all for the effort you have put into this worthwhile democratic campaign. I believe that part of government's role is to build a better and stronger democracy for future generations to participate in. I want the UK to be the great meritocracy of the world, 
and a fundamental part of this is ensuring all young people get the best possible start in life. I am determined to build a country that works for everyone and ensure that young people can go as far as their talents show, regardless of their backgrounds. The UK Youth Parliament is a wonderfully inclusive example of democracy in action. You are drawn from all different backgrounds and represent the breadth and diversity of our society today. This opportunity is one you can use to build the skills you need to succeed in life. By being part of today's event, you are already on a path to making a positive change. The points you make today are valuable and it is important that we listen to you. I hope that you have a fantastic day in the Commons and I wish you well for the future. The Prime Minister, Theresa May. Lauren, thank you very much indeed for that and our thanks, of course, to the Prime Minister for her support, which is extremely important to the UK Youth Parliament. Order, order. The Youth Parliament will now consider the first motion of the day. We must stop cuts that affect the NHS. The full motion is printed on the order paper. To move the motion, I call from Yorkshire and the Humber, expecting a very warm welcome from you all, Ashley Gregory. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 1942, Sir William Beveridge said that medical treatment covering all requirements will be provided for all citizens by a National Health Service. The NHS was born. 74 years later, the National Health Service, the service that has provided for countless young people across the country, is at risk of being cut to a service that provides a bare minimum. The Government has set out plans for the NHS to make £22 billion of efficiency savings by running the service more efficiently. However, the important issue is whether or not this will affect the quality of service that is provided. £22 billion is more than double the amount that the Government spends on the entire transport department, so we mustn't underestimate the scale of savings that are to be made. These savings affect all of you directly, from the amount of time you'll wait to see your doctor to the availability of a dentist appointment in your local authority. In places such as Huddersfield, we've already seen the devastating effects that these cuts are having. Here, the proposal to close the A&E department has been given the go-ahead in order to centralise services to Halifax, meaning that people needing often life-saving treatment are having to travel even further to get this. We must have our views and interests heard and stop further cuts such as this. At a local level, many services are finding that the funding they receive per patient is reducing. This includes services such as school nursing. Surely it is wrong to cut such local and, more importantly, vital services. Surely it is wrong that healthcare is becoming a sort of postcode lottery, depending on the amount of funding that your local area receives. I believe this is fundamentally wrong. Over the past year, the UK Youth Parliament has been campaigning to improve mental health services, and we've seen some amazing changes, especially in my local area of Rotherham, where we've met with service providers. We should continue to improve mental health services across the country, but surely this cannot be possible if we allow the devastating cuts to the NHS to take place. Cuts that will dismantle, damage and dissolve the National Health Service that we all know and love. Everyone has mental health and the cuts should not put this at stake. NYPs, we should be lobbying local NHS trusts, MPs and unions to protect services specifically for young people. To me, that one unavailable appointment in your A&E department could potentially be the difference between a life and death-threatening situation. The NHS may be a complex issue, but that doesn't mean that change is impossible. Change happens when you fight for something you believe in. Change happened in 1948 when the NHS was founded, and change can happen here today in this chamber. Nye Bevan once said that the NHS will last as long as there are folk left with faith to fight in it. Now I ask you all this question. Do you have the faith to fight for your NHS? Thank you.
Ashley, thank you for a very fluent and assured start to our proceedings. To oppose the motion, I call from the east of England, hoping and expecting that you will give this speaker an equally enthusiastic and warm welcome, Nicholas Gardner. Thank you. The National Health Service is one of the UK's great institutions. Based on the commitment of universal health care free at the point of use and a core principle that we should protect and preserve. However, it would not be an understatement to say that the NHS is one of the most complicated aspects of government with so many moving parts. And the question I pose to you today is this. What lasting change can we really make on this sprawling beast? NYPs, our challenge is great and our time is short. When we have an issue that is so complex and so fraught with difficulty to implement, a year spent on this campaign would be a year spent just trying to get to grips with the issues that face the NHS while making no real progress. And the target of this campaign, on cuts, could steer us away from the true issues of the NHS. Maintaining high standards for young people, be that shorter wasting times, less bureaucracy, or greater targeted services. Our doctors and nurses are some of the, great, are some of, are some of the best in the world, but we must ensure they are able to continue to deliver a high quality of service in this climate of greater pressure. And this question of quality, Mr Speaker, is key. Is the NHS really all down to money? Standards matter to every young person across the UK, and just writing a blank cheque doesn't raise standards. We've all had experience of poor services, as demonstrated in our past mental health campaigns, and should we not aim for an NHS driven by quality of service rather than quantity of money? Finally, what would a national campaign look like when a lot of our services are dealt with on a local basis? County, not country, is responsible for many of our services now, and an issue for the North East may not necessarily be the same for the South West. We would struggle to coordinate a national message as we face very different issues from NHS Trust to NHS Trust. Now, we, as MYPs and young people, should express our undivided commitment to healthcare free at the point of use. But this campaign is not the way to do it. And to answer Nye Bevan, I am willing to fight for the NHS, but it must be one worth fighting for. Not one that may waste money on out of date and ageing infrastructure, but one that is efficient, of a higher quality, and safer and that works for every young person and benefits every young person across this great country. Thank you very much. Nicholas, thank you very much. Now, I'd like to call a speaker, assuming somebody wishes to contribute, from Scotland. Is there a speaker willing to contribute from Scotland? Not if you don't want to. Yes, very well. Representing uh, Glasgow and West Scotland, uh, the NHS was created to ensure that the poverty and the pain and the suffering before the war, and to think that we can't fix it in a year, of course you can't fix the NHS in a year, but if we can commit to ensuring that the NHS is a vital service, free at the point of use, for everyone, regardless of, what they believe, regardless of who they are, we have to support it. The NHS is not one of the most important institutions. It is the most important institution in the United Kingdom, and we should do everything we can to protect that. Who, who wants to contribute from Wales? Is there anybody here from Wales who wants to contribute in this debate? Not if you don't want to. No. You do wish to... There are two uh, gentlemen here. I'm Samuel Taylor and I'm the MYP for Blaine Gwent. The NHS is one of the United Kingdom's national treasures. It is a unique virtue of our amazing country. Very few countries have a healthcare system like our own. 
and therefore we need to preserve it and work towards stopping cuts that affect our NHS. I feel very strongly about this issue as I'm MYP for Blind of Gwent, which is an Iron Bevan's original constituency. He worked so very hard to help find the NHS to improve our healthcare system. So surely we should work equally as hard to help preserve our healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you. Every year I always strive incredibly hard to get almost an exact, almost an exact gender balance. And so far we've not heard from women. Now what about the West Midlands? Have we got a female speaker from the West Midlands? No, not in this debate. Well, in that case, I'm going to look somewhere else. Who have we got who wishes to contribute from the South East? Anybody on this from the South East? Yes, a young woman here, please. Um, with the recent fall in the value of the pound, the UK economy is much weaker. Cuts are constantly being made to the services, and as transforming as this campaign sounds, it's just not achievable. Even if, our MP if even our MPs cannot protect the NHS from being cut down in certain areas, how are we as a youth parliament going to influence the government to commit to such a proposal? I think that we should focus our votes on to campaigns that we'll really see a change in a year. Thank you. What about the north-east of England? Have we got anybody wanting to contribute from the north-east? Please. Anna Douglas, Gateshead. The NHS is at the heart and soul of each of our lives, from every birth to every death, dealing with the physical and emotional pain that we suffer. To fund the NHS is not just to fund the services that we need, it is to fund our future. As NYPs, we have to think about what we want out of our NHS. I know for sure that I would like a guaranteed free service throughout my life for me, for all young people, and for everybody that deserves it. Thank you, Hannah. That was a wonderfully succinct speech, and a speech delivered without a note. That was quite outstanding. Well done, you. Have we got anybody wanting to contribute to this debate from Northern Ireland? Not from Northern Ireland. OK. Who have we got from London who wants to take part in this debate? What about the, the young woman at the back with the black jacket and the yellow dress? Please. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My name is Amishta Oblak and I represent the London Borough of Redbridge. Did you know that the NHS deals with over one million patients every 36 hours? And that the NHS approximately deals with 54.3 million patients in England alone and 64.6 .6 million patients in the whole of England? Cutting funding that affects the NHS inevitably affects every single one of us sitting here today. Not only does the NHS provide a considerable amount of employment, but it's the UK's dependency on such a critical service that makes it so important. Cuts to the NHS shouldn't be considered simply because we would fall apart without it. How about a contributor from the East Midlands? We've got somebody from the East Midlands. Yes, the young man here. Who... Yes, your good self. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Keen Hernshaw for Lincolnshire. I myself love the NHS, and I would like to pay my respect to the workers of the NHS, who provide world-class care even in dire economic times. But the NHS is firmly in the hands of the regular members of Parliament who sit in this chamber, and I feel the NHS is not an issue that should be addressed by young people when there are better uses of members of Youth Parliament's time. I will be voting myself for anti-discrimination to remain the issues of the campaigns, and I call upon you all to do the same. The government has trouble dealing with the NHS, as well as with the EU, the economy. The great and the good are focusing on these issues, and I feel the youth parliament cannot do anything more effective than is currently being achieved. One thing we can do, however, is tackle discrimination. In my opinion, the more important campaign of fighting the discrimination at the heart of society needs every fibre of our being and time. Thank you. Now, surely there's somebody from the North West. <laughs> Very lucky. Yes. Yes. Well, we'll try to accommodate as many as we can over a period. The, the young woman in the red dress, red or orange. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. My name is Victoria Matashevska um, and I'm from the Salford constituency. Now, the topic stopping cuts to NHS has not surprised me to come in in the top five from a make and mark ballots because, as we can tell, a lot of us, the young people, feel like we need to do something about it. But now, of course, the cuts in the NHS is something very, very important. But do we have the power and do we have the influence to be able to make the decision with the Parliament to stop these cuts? As was said before, it's not, now it's not the Parliament that does the cuts. Now it's the counties. The counties have to decide. And I think, as a young elected representative, that we have much more important issues to deal with, like votes at 16 and stopping cuts to youth services than something like stopping cuts to the NHS, because in my opinion, and in the opinion of many people here, I assume, we don't have the power to stop the cuts. Thank you. What about Yorkshire and Humberside? Who do we have from Yorkshire and Humberside? Yes, the, the gentleman nearest to me. Nearest to me, the longish, longish hair. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, William McCullion for Yorkshire and Humber. I would like to highlight the fact that as MYPs, as members of the United Kingdom Youth Parliament, we are a neutral organisation. I must say that cuts are an austerity measure, and to some, austerity is the answer to our economic troubles, and to others, austerity is some terrible behemoth that must be slain. So I ask of you, how can we hope to approach this tremendous issue in a neutral, politically unbiased fashion that appeases us, appeases us all? Thank you. Now, what about the quite sizeable delegation from London? Who's interested from London? Yes, the young woman here, please. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My name is Tafumi Omisol and I represent the London Borough of Hounslow. And the reason why I feel stop cuts that affect the NHS is really important is not just because maybe there are cuts that are affecting people's physical health, but under these services we have mental health provisions which are already underfunded and they are already suffering and that means young people aren't getting the services that they need in order to treat their mental health issues or to even just ask for help or seek help for these issues. And so in the UK, when cuts, are, when cuts against the NHS are made, the NHS is therefore unable to add funding to mental health services, which is already underfunded. So by cutting it even more, we are therefore having another effect on all the young people who suffer with mental health issues that are trying to seek help from the NHS but cannot because there are no provisions available or there isn't enough, which is why I really feel strongly that we should vote on this motion. Thank you. Thank you. West Midlands? Yes, the gentleman there from the West Midlands. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm Glenn Corder from MYP for Redditch. And um, my biggest concern with this is if you add up the, um, the shortfall of funding for the um, NHS, it's, it, for this year, it's probably around £6 billion. And if, uh, if, if we can't do it now, for certain, we won't be able to do it in the um, coming years. The second problem is the um, psychological pressure for... Um, future medics, especially young ones, who are in a sixth form right now thinking about it. The, uh, the huge pressure um, for the NHS is uh, affecting their attitudes. And um, finally, uh, the youth services are slightly affected disproportionately. For example, um, the 11% less um, school nurses, I believe, uh, this year, so yes. Thank you. Now, there was quite a large group of people from the North West who stood. Yes, the tendency to demonstrative behaviour tends to increase by the year, and I say this in no insulting or critical spirit. I was much struck by the young woman with the green jacket and pink dress who's in a state of almost uncontrollable excitement. <laughs> And we look forward to hearing from you. Please. Um, my name is Jennifer Backledge. I'm from Stockport. And the NHS is an extremely important service. It has drastic impacts on my life as someone who is disabled. It had drastic impacts on my dad's life. He had a brain hemorrhage. 
But by doing this one year campaign, because remember, MYPs, our campaigns only last one year, we will be doing our NHS a disservice by campaigning for only one year. We can't really do anything. Tackling cuts of the NHS is a lifelong campaign that we should all be fighting for our entire lives. MYPs, we already stand for this issue as it is on our manifesto. By making it our campaign, we're just wasting money because we can't do something in one year, whereas there are much more important issues on here that we can do something in one year. So it would just be a waste and a disservice to our NHS that they need our time and our effort to care for it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, can I interest Scotland again in the matter? Yes, the young woman there. The... Molly Kirby, North East Scotland. Our generation's epidemic. That was the response that us as members of the Scottish Youth Parliament got from young people of our nation when we asked them, what do you think of mental health? Now, I believe you as English MYPs should choose this as your campaign because we are facing a fundamental crisis in our mental health services. I really strongly believe that we can help young people if you choose this. Now, obviously, it isn't um, a matter for Scotland as the NHS is devolved, but imagine what we could do with a nationwide campaign to stop mental health cuts. There is no need to cut f funding from the NHS. It has survived this long. If they can find funding, to fund Trident, to take people out, yeah. um, to yeah. fight yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. terrorists, then surely they can yes. find funding to secure our NHS. So I urge you all today to vote for this as your national campaign for England. Thank you very much indeed. Now, there are only two parts of the UK so far, from which I've not been able to elicit a speaker, so I'm just going to have another go. South West. Can I persuade anybody from the South West? Yes. <laughs> there is a, a young woman brandishing a document, <laughs> or a pad, whatever. Anyway, please, and by the way, if I can encourage people to say their name, that would be great. Speaker, I'm Kira Lewis, the member for Taunton Dean and West Somerset. Well, the every NHS deals with everyday emergencies, and the very heart of our society. I'd like to thank the junior doctors who came to my previous school when they were meant to be on strike to teach the masses CPR, a very valuable skill. <laughs> now, that happened all over the country in all of our constituencies, but they weren't heard and they weren't listened to because the media didn't want to play that out. We need to not just fight for current, but targeted services for rural young people who, over the years, services have been decimated. Could I ask, can we help, though? I'd like to thank regular members of the Chamber for taking a very strong interest and passion in mental health, in physical health, and everything else the NHS covers, including the member for my area, Taunton Dean, Rebecca Powell, for looking into young people's mental health in the area. We need to fight for the unheard in mental health services, fight for the one in four, fight for us who every day go day by day needing our help and not getting it because of the cuts to this. Mm. We need to encourage our generation into medicine, into the medical field, a very valuable field indeed, and we need to hold the regular chamber to account for their actions. But I say we cannot do that by ourselves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. When you mentioned Taunton Dean, I immediately thought of my colleague Rebecca Powell, who is a most active member of this place. And if you're as active in the youth parliament as she is in this chamber, then you're taking a very, very active and conscientious interest indeed. I'm going to make one last effort in this debate to attract a speaker from Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland? Yes, perhaps the, the, the young woman towards the back. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my name is Emma Rooney and I represent South Down. Yes, I agree our NHS is a very important service and that we should be able to access healthcare free and at the point of delivery. But the NHS is not the only service that is facing cuts. What about our fire service, our police service, 
our schools. We cannot ignore the fact that austerity is damaging our public services. While I agree that it is very important to fund the NHS, we must fund all our public services if we expect them to work. How are we supposed to have effective public services if we don't put any money into them? So yes, to my MYPs in England, I do agree that you should fund your NHS, but please think twice about not funding your other public services as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed from that. We've had participants from all parts of the country, and that is extremely welcome. To conclude the debate... Fr- the east? The east of England. <laughs> yes, we have had an, in- an East of England contributor at the start of the debate. If somebody from the back... Or- If somebody from the back benches, that's a very fair point, we had a contributor from the front bench from the east of England. We haven't had a back bench contributor from the east of England. If there is a back bench contributor from the east of England, I should be delighted to hear him or her. (laughs) Good. Thank you. That's a very fair heckle. It's what we call an orderly heckle. OK, we'll take this gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My name is Matthew Tinker. I'm the Member of Youth Parliament for Epping Forest. The NHS is a fundamental part of the United Kingdom. It is a very British organisation. Imagine losing Anton Deck. Imagine, <laughs> imagine the BBC losing Great British Bake Off. <laughs> oh, well, I've started something now. But the NHS is vital to the infrastructure of the United Kingdom. Now, I'm so proud that my grandmother served in the NHS, and I'm so proud that my auntie serves in the NHS. And these are our future jobs. Members of Youth Parliament who are currently studying A-levels or university, GCSEs, whatever you're studying, your future jobs are at stake, but also the jobs of people who are currently working in the NHS. It is underfunded. It completely is. Remember, it is our future. Now, it is a critical part of British infrastructure, and I have to say that the NHS cares for all of us. So no matter whether you are black, white, gay, straight, rich or poor, we all have free access to healthcare. So that all of our teachers have access. So that all of our religious leaders have access. So that your bus and transport drivers have access. So all of our politicians have access. Have you noticed how each of the debates upcoming, I've just said members of those groups, the NHS provides for all and I really hope that we are able to vote for this issue today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have been giving each other rounds of applause, but I don't deserve applause. All I've done is said some words, strung them together into sentences, and represent my constituents. If you want to give anyone applause, give your nurses, give your doctors, give your junior doctors your applause. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that speech. I'm so glad that we had an additional speaker, a backbench speaker from the East of England as opposed to the speaker from the front bench. Now, to conclude the debate, I call and ask you very enthusiastically to welcome from the East Midlands, Florence Orchard. Thank you, Mr Speaker. MYPs. I don't know about you, but when I first heard about stop cuts that affect the NHS, well, I wasn't really sure about the issue, let alone how it impacts young people. After all, what even is an efficiency cut? What is a CPG? And £22 billion? Well, where did that number even come from? Yet, over 100,000 young people felt passionate enough to put a cross in the box in hopes to make it our national campaign, so we simply cannot ignore it. The NHS is one of Britain's greatest achievements, and we have some of the most amazing healthcare professionals in the world. From hearing the debate, it's clear that we all care about it and want to make it the best service it can possibly be. However, many believe it's already underfunded, and new savings of roughly one-fifth of the current budget will likely overstretch the NHS. If this happens, it will directly impact you all. From longer waiting times to the potential closing of A&Es, 
The likelihood of maintaining good quality services while making the savings needed is very low. This is a brand new and exciting campaign that we as a youth parliament could come together to work on, to fight any changes to our NHS and to guarantee a positive environment for all those who are ill. With this campaign, there is the opportunity to utilise our previous work of tackling mental health while still focusing on a new issue. However, nobody can dispute that the NHS is an extremely complicated structure and is perhaps just too much to try and combat within one year. With local authorities becoming more independent, and in Manchester's case devolving from the NHS entirely, it calls to question whether this should be a local campaign instead of a national one. With structures like the NHS Youth Forum already in place, should we be working with these organisations or leaving them to it? Due to the complexity of the health service, perhaps it would be wiser to spend our time campaigning on a different issue. Furthermore, some may believe that this campaign is unnecessary, as the Government has already committed to spending roughly 23% of its budget on the NHS. And yes, this 23% will maintain the current state of the NHS. For the moment, when taking increasing population size into account, this is only a short-term solution. If we work together to lobby our MPs and local health services and show our passion for this issue on social media, then we have the potential to create a stable NHS, not just for the short term, but for the long term. MYPs, today it falls to you. Is this campaign just too complex and ambitious, or is it worth the work to create an amazing change? Thank you. Florence, thank you for rounding off the debate in terrific style. It's been a great first debate. I hope you're energised and inspired by the contributions you've either made or heard others make. And we will now proceed to the second motion, members of the Youth Parliament, of the day, namely votes for 16 and 17-year-olds in all public elections. The full motion is printed on the order paper to move the motion I call and ask you warmly to welcome from Scotland, Jack Norquoy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Hello, my name is Jack and I'm 17 and I can vote in Scotland and I did vote in May and I cannot begin to emphasise the honour it was to cast my ballot in May. And here's why I believe that every single 16 and 17 year old in this country should also be able allowed to vote. Lowering the voting age comes down to two things, maturity and marginalisation. We know what 16 and 17 year olds can contribute, but smoking isn't voting. Voting is a civil rights issue. However, we can offer much more to our society most of us are making major decisions about our futures, and many of us already do offer much more by holding responsibilities like being a young carer. Today, we are grounded with an interest of current affairs and granted a vote. We, as a youth parliament, can help transform this interest into direct political engagement. Early engagement with politics will help to create lasting improvements to turnout and help create the more representative democracy we so desperately need. As we sit in the heart of this democracy, we are also sitting together as the voices that should be represented in this democracy. The 2014 Scottish referendum proved if you give us the responsibility, we will cast it on polling day. That day saw queues of teenagers outside polling stations with three in four teenagers voting. It was that day that led to the Scottish Parliament unanimously lowering the voting age. We find ourselves in the absurd situation where if you are a 16-year-old lad from Dumfries you can vote for a councillor next May. But if you live just 30 miles down the road in Carlisle, you can't. Following June's EU referendum, we do face difficulties ahead and further marginalisation. 
but a great opportunity is also here. Extending the franchise is no longer just about voting, but it's about reversing the trend of young people's marginalisation and making sure that government benefits from the legitimacy and oversight of all of its citizens. In my piece, we are here to debate and decide between five great topics. But bear this in mind. Gaining the right to vote at 16 will give us all the power to seek change to our education service, the power to seek change to our transport system, the power to seek change to our health service, and the power to tackle racism and religious discrimination. Voting at 16 should not be determined by what accent you have. Now, now is the time, Youth Parliament. It is time for this United Kingdom to be united in the right to vote at 16. Thank you. Jack, thank you for that very powerful speech. Thank you, members of the Youth Parliament, for your warm and enthusiastic welcome of it. And especially thank you to the Scottish Delegation Fan Club of Jack <laughs> for their explicit and demonstrative show of support, which is entirely in order. Just before I ask you to welcome our next speaker, it is my practice to try to identify members of the House of Commons who are here to support you, but I'd also like to mention a very senior member of our staff who is taking an interest in and here to offer support to you, and that is the clerk assistant in the House, the second most senior procedural official in the House of Commons, Dr John Benger. John, just put your hand up so everybody can see you. Thank you. Members of the Youth Parliament, I work with John every day of the working week to try to make this place function better, and I can tell you that John is a terrific ally to me in trying to promote diversity and inclusion within the House service, that is to say, in the staff makeup of this place. And it's absolutely typical of him that he should be here to support you. So, John, thank you to you, and of course, thank you to all of our clerks who can be relied upon to provide a terrific service. Now, I would ask you enthusiastically to welcome our next speaker to oppose the motion from Wales, Matthew von Royen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It's always a pleasure to serve in your chairmanship, and I'm delighted to be here for another year. And I thank you for all the work that you've been doing to ensure that the UK Youth Parliament sits here every year, year after year. Thank you, Mr Speaker. If I... If I may be, indulge, uh, ask your indulgence a moment, Mr Speaker, I'd just like to pay, uh, pay tribute to Christina Rees, uh, Member of Parliament for Neath, uh, not only as my employer but as someone who champions uh, young people. In the last fortnight we've spoken on several debates um, affecting young people and affecting young people's mental health, and I would just like to thank you for all the work you've been doing, Chris. It's a pleasure to work with you, and thank you for everything. Yeah. The House of Commons the heart of our democracy. Developed over many centuries, this is the heart of where democracy is. And that's why we're here today, to do democracy. We do, however, have a government that have a majority in this place that not only not in favour of, but actively oppose reducing the voting age from 18. With rumours of a second Scottish independence referendum and the recent result of the, of the referendum showing a majority of British people wish to leave the European Union, and with recent developments in the United States of America, the Government are going to be far too busy working on policies other than what are absolutely necessary. We are not going to be able to get this support over the next year. What we are seeing from this Government yet again is the Government putting young people to the back of the queue. 
the government excluding young people from the democratic process, young people being excluded from taking part in democracy. What we are seeing is the government stifling democracy. It's a very real fact that we won't bring about any change over the next year or for the next several years. So I ask you this. Is now really the right time to invest all our energy on a campaign that is destined to fail? For this campaign to be a success, we have just 365 days, 52 weeks, 12 months, a year. Alongside MPs and peers, we have been, we have been campaigning to reduce the voting age for well over a decade. And for our efforts, what do we have to show? Well, can any under 18 year old lawfully vote for their Member of Parliament? To achieve success, we need time, resources and the support of the Government. I note that the Minister for Civil Society is not in his place at the moment, but I would ask him, when he does read back and watch this debate, that he does consider young people and does consider bringing young people into our democracy. However, the action plans do nothing to change the Government's policy. It calls for the submission of a local council motion. Mr Speaker, a local council motion. It calls for us to write to the local press. The local press, really. And it calls for MPs to sponsor a debate, not on the floor of this House under your chairmanship, Mr Speaker, but down the corridor in Westminster Hall. Whilst these, whilst these campaign plans may be effective for a local campaign, these are going to do nothing, I suggest, to change government policy on reducing the voting age. I suggest today that our votes should be used on a topic that has a realistic prospect of success to achieve what our constituents truly want. Friends, I suggest to you all today that you do not vote for votes at 16. Without government support and without substantial changes to education policy to introduce a curriculum for life, reducing the voting age would be deeply unwise and almost impossible. Friends, we have been elected here today by our constituents to do democracy. The campaign for a curriculum for life and tackling racial and religious discrimination came top of the priority ballot. They received the most amount of votes. Today, friends, we are here to do democracy. And if we truly are going to do democracy and make the most of this opportunity, we will vote in the way that our constituents have told us to vote. And that is for voting for a curriculum for life and voting for tackling racial discrimination. Thank you very much. Thank you. Matthew, thank you very much indeed for that speech. We've had a great start to the debate. Now, who do we have from Yorkshire and Humberside wishing to contribute to this debate? What about the young woman there, the, the second along, holding an exercise book, still standing? Yes, it indeed it is you. Thank you. Liberty Leeds from Yorkshire and Humber. Um, I'm 13, and to me it seems quite a long time till I'll be voting. And I know you represent everyone, 18 to 11. Now, if five pe years of people are not affected by this campaign, do they feel excluded and maybe not as affected in our community? Now, I think it's really important. I don't have a view on this campaign, really, yet. But um, <laughs> I think it's quite important to bear the views of younger ch people as well as yourselves because I know a lot of you are older. <laughs> um, so thank you, and just bear that in my mind. Thank you very much indeed, and congratulations on your first speech in the House of Commons. Now, do we have a would-be contributor from Northern Ireland? Yes. What about the young gentleman here with the... the Red hair. Yes, please. <laughs> F thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm Leo Welsh. I'm f representing East London there. In, in Northern Ireland, we are in a unique position. We actually have a land border with the EU, and in light of the EU referendum, it became quite clear that there's a clear democratic deficit in regards to elections in general in the UK. The vast majority of Northern Ireland voted to stay in the EU, and none of Scotland voted out. So it, it becomes quite clear to me and my constituency that we, that we clearly aren't being listened to in the UK in general. 
We we really, I I believe fundamentally that this was an England-based election, because we're being dragged out of the EU against our will, and we we have a land border with the Republic of Ireland, and a lot of our economy sort of relies on cross-border trade. And if a if a land border was to go up, our economy is going to be damaged beyond repair. And I I believe through back in vote at 16. This election could have been changed if we would have had the vote. And as the, at the start of the debate, the entrance into the debate, it, it became quite the, the right, what I'm making the point is, in Scotland, they have the votes at 16, so why can't the rest of us? Thank you. Now, the East of England. Who do we have wanting to contribute from the East of England? What about the young woman here with the, the white top? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm Rihanna May Duffy from Bedford Borough. I'm fighting for the right for 16 and 17-year-olds to vote because you're allowed to leave home, get a job, have kids at 16, but not vote. How can you live in a world if you can't vote and you don't have a say in how it's run? That's what the suffragettes fought for. The MP for Bristol said cutting the voting age would be a vital step in the renewal of Britain's democracy. I understand some people think this is a hard campaign to achieve. However, don't UKYP love a good challenge? Now, what about London? Who do we have from London? What about the young man here with the red tie from London? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm Sean Sinanen, representing the London Borough of Enfield. You see, the issue for voting at 16 has affected youths for a very long time. The issue has repeatedly popped up on the ballot, and it's time to take the, the issue on again. The main argument against voting at 16 is simply outdated, saying that we are not old enough or mature to vote is simply stereotypes. For example, Mr Speaker, look around at all the beautiful people who <laughs> simply defy that statement. You see, at 16, we are practically allowed to grow up but restrained from our voices being heard. In addition, considering the, well, controversial current affairs, this topic is more important than ever and a way for the youth that can be included in our society. Moreover, to those MPs who believe that it isn't realistic to tackle topics such as these and change isn't possible, your mindset needs to be changed. Because let me tell you something, change cannot happen without a sense of idealism. We need to have faith in ourselves before we put faith in the campaigns. Therefore, choose this topic and together let's finally put this issue at rest. <laughs> Now, thank you very much indeed. Who wants to contribute from the West Midlands? The West Midlands. This chap is waving at me. <laughs> Fist, thumb, the rest. A marvellous demonstration of enthusiasm. Please, let's hear from you. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Mr Speaker. OK, most of us here are between the age of 11 to 18. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds. Can't we stand as peers together to help you, by the age that you reach 16, to be able to vote? 16, 17 and 18 year olds, 16, 17 year olds, we, we should be able to have the uh, eligible to be able to vote right now. We should stand peer to peer as students of the United Kingdom, stand together to say, yes, we can vote for our democracy, for our future that depends on us because we are the future. We are fantastic. We are powerful. We are amazing. We are the best, because we are the youth of the United Kingdom. And we have the best, sorry, we are the best. And it's simple. If we vote together, if we stand together to say we can vote at the age of 16 and 17, we'll be setting an example. Thank you, Scotland. Thank you so much for saying now that, that you voted for your referendum. Because at the moment, it is the senior citizens that are voting in this country at the moment. But as we are helping them to sort out how to use the Snapchat filters, <laughs> let's sort out ourselves, because we are mature. Look at us all here at the moment. It's showing that we're mature, we're responsible, that we can vote. So let's stand and we'll sit down right now and say, <laughs> yes, we can vote for the age 16, because remember, the 11 to 15 year olds, we, you will thank us later on to say, yes, in a few years' time, I will be able to vote for my democracy, for my, uh, whether it be 
any political party that you want, because you will say, I had a voice, and you will decide for your future. So let's stand together and vote <laughs> at the age of 16 and 70 you vote. Thank you for addressing us with great vim, dynamism and eloquence. And I'm quite sure that what you say about young people and the people in this chamber is true. Can I just very gently remind people in their enthusiasm not to forget to say their names? <laughs> I am Sergeant Hero from Wolverhampton. I study performing arts, so I love acting, so this is why talking is <laughs> favouritism of mine, OK? Vote for 16, 17 rows. We need it! We deserve it the most in the world! And we will set the perfect up. There, our friend here, in addition to these many, many other great attributes, clearly has a very long name. <laughs> but we're extremely obliged to him. Thank you for that contribution and for the passion that you've shown. Now, who do we have wanting to contribute from the south-east of England? Yes, the south-east of England. I think I'm going to choose the, the young woman with the, what, what I think I can call the flowery dress. Yes, thank you. A 16-year-old can leave school and get an apprenticeship. A 16... And just, just, hold, just hold on one moment. Just hold on one moment. Just hold, just hold on one moment. If every speaker can remember to say, before anything else... <laughs> I know it's difficult, because you want to get on with your speech. Your name, that would be great. It would really help those who are keeping a record. Please, start again. Sorry, I'm Beth Thornton, and I'm for the NYP for the South East. A 16-year-old can leave school and get an apprenticeship. A 16-year-old can start a family. A 16-year-old can be liable to pay taxes. A 16-year-old can fight for their country. And a 16-year-old can get married. Why, then, are they not given the responsibility of voting? How can we be told that, yes, we can contribute money to our country, but, no, we do not have a say in how it's spent? How can we be told that, yes, we can risk our lives for our country, but do not have a say in what our, we are risking our lives for. It is such an important issue that together we can combat this. Together we can change and give 16- and 17-year-olds a right to vote. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about the things that matter. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot be silent. We need to stand up and fight for our rights, for our voices to be heard. Thank you. Just before I try to secure a speaker from the South West, so think about that if you're from the South West, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome, sitting in the under gallery, unless my eyesight is failing me, and I trust that it isn't, Stephen Benn. Yeah. Wave. Thank you. I mention Stephen for two reasons. First, because he does fantastic work to bring together the science community and Parliament, and he and I have been working together on that cause over many, many years. Secondly, Stephen is brother to Hilary Benn, who is an extremely respected and senior member of this House and a former Cabinet Minister, currently chair of the so-called Brexit Select Committee. And Stephen is, of course, the son of the late, and whatever your politics, the great parliamentarian Tony Benn, who spent a half a century of his life... spent a half a century of his life in politics and being passionate in and on behalf of Parliament. Stephen, it's great to welcome you. Thank you very much for joining us today. So, the South West. Who have we got from the South West? Who wants to contribute? What about the, the woman in the, the mustard coat? I hope that isn't an inaccurate description of the colour. Thank you. Um, Jessica Hill. Oh, thank you, Speaker. Jessica Hill from South Somerset. Um, as youth parliament, we should be fighting for our youth voice and youth issues. Uh, yes, representing young people in our constituencies is terribly important. But we should hold them up and let them tell us what they want and they need. I am 16, and in the next two years, I highly doubt I will suddenly happen upon an epiphany that will allow me to vote appropriately, as according to the people against this issue, I will. It might be difficult, it might be a hard way for us to go about this issue, but when has that ever stopped us? 
I refuse to stand for young people not having a voice. As a youth parliament member, I say let us speak for ourselves. Thank you. Now, what about the north west, northwest of England? Who have we got from the northwest? Well, there's a gentleman gesticulating with great intensity. The young gentleman here with the blue tie. Please, let's hear from you, sir. Mr. Speaker, my name is Chen Kai Xie, representing Preston, Lancashire. Coming from China to the UK three years ago, my life has been changed greatly. Living in a liberal democracy, I'm fully aware and appreciate the importance of voting rights. However, I personally do not agree with the motion of lowering the voting age to the age of 16. I oppose to my honourable friend's argument that young people need to vote to make a political impact. There are a variety of ways for us to participate in politics. The brilliant work done by us, the British Youth Parliament, is a great example. Although many of us probably can't vote at general elections, we can nevertheless to make our mark in the British Youth politics. We have a real impact on government, and the most important thing is we can campaign to make positive changes for every young people in the country. On the other hand, I'm very sad and even embarrassed to say people aged between 18 and 24 has consistently been the group with the lowest turnout at past elections and even the EU referendum, which would have massive impact on young people's life. It would be irrational of us to lower the voting age while leaving the apathy young voters' voice unheard. Clearly, there is a democratic deficit here. More should be done to engage young people into politics. For example, voting for the campaign to create a curriculum for that to prepare us with appropriate political curriculum to enrich our political mind would be great. My fellow MIPs, after all, a line has to be drawn somewhere, and the age of 18 is a sensible cutting point. And all the evidence are telling us the time for lowering the voting age has yet to come. Thank you. Just before I call uh, a speaker, if possible, from the East Midlands, so start thinking about it if you're interested, I should just mention vis-à-vis the the Ben family that, as some people know, I was always hugely fond of and had a terrific relationship with Tony Ben, and I was given to impersonating him. Now, Tony Ben, towards the end of his life, said most magnificently, most magnificently, he was always a believer in young people, but he said most magnificently, The only purpose of the old is to encourage the young. And I thought that was a wonderful statement of his approach to life. Now, who do we have from the East Midlands? Yes, let's take... Oh, there's a chap who's literally leaping off the ground. He's going to be airborne ere long. Yes, the chap with the blonde curly hair who was leaping off the ground. He's in a minority of one in doing so. Please. I would just like to point out for this moment, I am Ginger. (laughs) <laughs> I'm Thomas Morell from Nottinghamshire. I'd just like to talk about the 23rd of June. It was a shocking day for some, and it was a day I sat at home and drank a lot of cup of teas. <laughs> I didn't have much of a choice. I couldn't vote. I literally had to watch my parents walk out the door, go vote, and go to work. And then I went to work. Like they do. They're over 18. I'm under 18. They get to vote. I don't. How is that fair? How can you compare? two people with a two-year age gap, or a much larger age gap, and say, <laughs> and say they get to vote, but I don't. There's 1.5 million, well, a lot more than 1.5 million 16- and 17-year-olds in the UK, and that could change the whole face of an election by just one vote, or maybe a lot of votes, 1.5 million of them. Imagine if we were on the electoral roll. Your vote is worth a lot, and it needs to be worth it now. Now, what about the northeast of England? The northeast of England. Yes. Are you from the northeast? No, you're not from the northeast. Yeah, we'll take the gentleman here then. Northeast of England. Thank you. Speaker, um, Tim Wald, Red Car in Cleveland, northeast. And just for anyone who thinks this motion can't, be, can't work, it can't be uh, acted on in a year, I just, I, can I just say this? If my mother can work day and night, two jobs every day of the week and the weekend. I'm pretty sure we can do a lot of good in one year to try and get votes at 16. Thank you. (laughs) 
is there a would-be female contributor from Wales? Yes, there is. With huge enthusiasm and gusto, say who you are and let us hear from you. Sean Bolton from Neathspot Talbot. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When I first saw that the issue was on the ballot, I was really torn. As an avid campaigner for Votes of 16 for many years, my initial reaction was to support it. However, I had mixed feelings about it being UK, UKYP's issue for 2016. Is this the right time? Last, the last government blocked the amendment from the Lords on the EU refer referendum for 16- to 17-year-olds being allowed to vote. If we chose this topic, would we struggle to achieve any real change? Are we better off placing this issue on the agenda before election year, when we can make an impact to political parties' manifestos? When I spoke to my forum about this, they lost it with me. They said, why should we let the fact that we've been stopped before stop us from trying? We have to keep pushing. And as always, they were right. We can't give up on this issue. We can't let this issue slip into the back of the agenda. We, can't, we have to keep pushing so that eventually everyone who is 16 will get the right to vote. We have to keep pushing for an answer. We have to keep pushing for a voice. We have to keep pushing until we finally get the piece of legislation that enfranchises us. The Ochenbau. Thank you. What about London? Who do we have from London? Yes, the, the woman here. Yes, thank you. Say your name. My name is Esther and I'm from the London Borough of Camden. Recently, in the past few years, young people have taken a new interest to politics. And this is due to the fact that the changes that are being discussed now will affect us as young people. So why do we not have the choice to, vo to, vote, to voice our opinions? Why is it that older... The, the, sorry. Why is it that the older generation get to, get to vote on matters that will not affect them for much longer? <laughs> I strongly believe that this motion is very important and we're meant to have the right to free speech, but do we? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry, but all good things come to an end. And although we're slightly behind time, we can't really afford to get further behind time, so we must now conclude the debate. And two... We haven't heard from Scotland in this debate. Well, we'll have a speaker from Scotland. Yeah, there no, we'll have a speaker from Scotland. Have the young woman there. Yes, indeed. Okay. Um, I'm Eleanor Pearce. I represent the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. Um, last year, 16 and 17 year olds in Scotland were able to vote. And for me personally, this is an absolutely amazing opportunity. And as an organisation that, that stands for equality, this is something that we should be fighting for across the UK. The second point I'd like to make is that politicians need to look around. Today the Chamber is filled with 280 young people who are all enthusiastic, knowledgeable about politics. And we are so often stereotyped as a disengaged, unresponsive generation due to our age. If you support this campaign, we can stand together and prove this view. I urge you to take a look at the next topic of debate. It's an utter contradiction that we should be adult and mature enough to pay full, full price for public transport and have other responsibilities, yet this doesn't transfer to benefits such as voting. Today, I'm not going to lie, I've been very disheartened by the, by the Youth Parliament. A word has been used a lot, can't, that we can't make a difference. What kind of message is this to our constituents? I can assure you that every speech, every vote, every letter does make a difference. We were elected because we can make change. Please support votes for 16 and 17 year olds. Please make a difference. Thank you. I, I will just emphasise that in each of the two debates, every part of the country has been heard. The very slight difference between us has been that colleagues have not regarded a front bench speech as counting. They wanted to be sure of having a back bench contributor from the east of England and from Scotland, and I'm very happy to respect that principle and to try to ensure that in each case that happens. But we now know for certain that every area of the country has been represented. It's not the same as saying I'm able to call everybody. Time doesn't allow that. But we are doing our best to ensure that this is a completely fair and equal process. Now, to conclude the debate, please give a very enthusiastic welcome to our concluding speaker from Northern Ireland, Dara O'Reilly.
Got a mohawk at Kim Kyle, um, Dara Riley from Northern Ireland. This, the age we live in, is a time of turmoil. A time of turmoil on Tuesday night, a time of turmoil on the 23rd of June. What I must say to you is that in this time of turmoil in our politics, in our government and in our society, does the government have the time to deal with this issue? It's not a question of should they, but will they? Secondly, I must ask you as well, can we even be successful in one short year? Is it enough time? And is 16 the right age? We are all aware of the total and utter shambolic way in which politics is taught in schools. Well, the way it's not. We see Curriculum for Life come up again and again in Make Your Mark, and this year the top issue. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I ask you this before the glass goes ought we to campaign for the education we need before the voting which we so want? However, it's not really true. I have seen campaigns come and I have seen them go. The one trick pony campaigns, the one shot ones. But I tell you this votes at 16 is no one trick pony. It is nothing short of handing young people the freedom to achieve freedom. The freedom to actually fund the NHS, the freedom to actually have a decent transport system, the freedom to tackle racism, it is a power to do so. And by Christ, if we're a youth parliament and say we don't want that power, we can't get that power, what are we but a talking shop? <laughs> 16 and 17 year olds would have kept us in the EU. I live five and a half miles from the Irish Republic. Do you think my constituents would be too happy when they were denied a vote that will end and the vote went a certain way due to an old guy in Kent, I love him and all, but the thing is, <laughs> is that my community is on the line and that this Government has no accountability to me or my constituents and if we don't stand up for them, I ask you this, Mr Speaker, if, it, if that is the United Kingdom, I'll eat my hat. You just imagine, you just imagine if a government decided to abolish tra the transport pass for pensioners and charge sky-high transport prices, which you do for us, or if a government abolished the housing benefit for over 65s, like they've done for under 21s, the government would be out in a day. We all know. And I'll tell you why, and we, you know why. Because old people vote and they vote in droves. If we had the vote and voted in droves, we'd no longer be the small part of the big society. Our issues would go from the top to the bottom, and we ought to do that. In the end, is voted 16 the key to the door of democracy? Or are we opening it to a beautiful brick wall? Go away, have a think, and get back to me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for winding up that debate with fluency, with sincerity and with the quality for which I think we're looking more than any other, and that is passion. That speech had passion in abundance, and that's a wonderful thing for the rest of us to observe. Thank you, colleagues. We now move to the third motion of the day for consideration by the Youth Parliament and, of course, members of the Youth Parliament, the last of the morning session. Make public transport cheaper, better and accessible for all. The full motion is printed on the order paper. To move the motion, please warmly welcome from the north-east of England, Liam Cartwright. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
I'm not sure how I followed that speech by Dara, but um, I'll give it a go. <laughs> So across the UK, we have the luxury of a diverse network of public transport systems, from rail, bus and ferry. On the surface, this is superb. We can all travel independently and hassle-free. It is only that when we look at the issues raised by our constituents that the can of worms truly starts to open. If you look back to 2012, when the issue of public transport first came to the agenda within UK Youth Parliament, we can see no change. Four years and still no change. The issues are still exactly the same. We young people are calling for cheaper, better and more accessible transport. We are calling for this now. The first change that we wish to see implemented is a standardised fare system for bus and rail across the UK. What would this look like? We would see the age at which you are obliged to purchase an adult ticket raised to 18. After all, in the eyes of the law, you turn adult at the age of 18. So I ask the question, why at the tender ages of 14, 15 and 16 are we paying adult fares? This is an injustice we believe must be ironed out. It is not right that transport companies capitalise from our necessity to use their services to attend compulsory education. In my constituency in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, a young person over the age of 18, 16, sorry, could pay up to £7 a day for a ticket. This is similar across the whole country, while those in London travel completely free. Why is this? There is no reason why fares should differ due to a geographical location, and this must be changed to a system of standardised fares for everyone. And finally, we wish to see clean, frequent and reliable bus and rail systems. In rural areas, the waiting time for a bus can be in excess of an hour. An hour can be the difference between a whole lesson late for school or on time. Bus companies need to produce a more frequent bus service in line with our needs. This issue returns time and time again. It has been debated in this very chamber over and over again. The time has now come that we must listen to the needs of our constituents and for the ever worsening issue of transport to be rectified. And how do we do this? We will lobby local governments and MPs to support this issue. We will make local services listen to our concerns until they understand that the issue of public transport can no longer be swept under the carpet and we will shape a transport service into a transport system for young people. We will provide fares that reflect our age, and we will have frequent bus services. Not only this, but it will be accessible to all. Let us be the generation of MYPs to make real change within transport. Thank you. Liam, thank you very much indeed for kicking off this third and final debate of the morning. Now, to oppose the motion, Please welcome enthusiastically from the northwest of England, Caitlin Cavana. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are massive levels of inequality between those deemed 15 year old adults and 18 year old children, between those who can miss a bus and still be on time, and those who will have to wait so long for another that they miss half their day. So how can anyone stand up here and say no? We should not work for better transport. The young people of my city, Liverpool, works for better transport by campaigning for our youth ticket, the My Ticket. The My Ticket enables me, as an under-19, to travel across six local authorities for £2 a day. Now, light bulbs should be flashing because better transport is achievable. We did it, but it took us over five years. We are in times of austerity where budgets are being cut like their paper in order to save money. So how will the government fund cheaper transport and concessions? Some people argue it should be from the £1.1 billion spent on bus passes for the elderly, something I know my nan wouldn't be too pleased about, <laughs> and she can vote. If we had over a year, perhaps we could apply enough pressure to the government so that they can find the money to support this, but 12 months just won't cut it. I know that I'm so lucky to have affordable transport, but you too can work within your local authority and focus on transport issues if you need to. 
Some people may argue against this because they believe that young people can't achieve it, and that's not the case. However, this success cannot be rushed. Problems with the campaign brief itself must also be considered, because what is better transport nationally? Better in Cornwall may be reducing unaffordable prices, whilst in London, a problem may be too many of us Northerners on the wrong side of the tube escalators. <laughs> and ask yourselves, would better transport in some places be better for our planet? In many urban areas, why work for better transport if it's already good? Why work for better transport when we can campaign for 16 and 17 year olds to vote in it in general elections instead? For us to be truly united as an organisation, I believe that we must tackle issues that affect all local authorities, not an issue that is a postcode lottery. So I will stand up here and say no. Working for better transport is not something we as a UK Youth Parliament should achieve, as this is a topic you must tackle in your local areas instead. Thank you. Caitlin, thank you very much indeed. Now, who do we have as a would-be contributor from the south-west of England? Yes, the woman waving at me with... Yeah, indeed, your good self. Yeah, no, 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 the woman who's just sat down. Yeah, you're good, yeah, indeed. Hi, I'm Chelsea White, and I'm from Somerset in the south-west. Um, in order for me to go to college every day, I have to pay £650 pound bus, bus pass every year. This is the most expensive bus pass in the country. I'm also from Bridgewater, which consists of the most deprived wards in Somerset. This financial pressure on families just to simply send their kids to an educational institution that is compulsory is absolutely disgusting. And even for low-income families like myself, that's still £300 a year. In regards to cost, how is it that we are categorised as adults on transport and made to pay these ridiculous fares, but in every other aspect of our lives we are treated as children? We need a national student fee introduced in order to provide equality within public transport. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's now timely for me to welcome Sir Peter Bottomley, who's just entered the chamber, who's the Conservative Member of Parliament for West Worthing, and off and on, mainly on, has been in this place since the mid-1970s. So he's got a very long track record of service to the House of Commons, and he's a long-time believer in the rights and opportunities of young people. Peter, thank you very much for joining us today. Do we have a would-be contributor from Wales? We do. Please, let's hear from you. Say who you are. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Samantha Locke from Torvine. I really don't think that I need to tell you people that transport needs to be cheaper and more accessible for us. In Wales, most of our buses don't have ramps. Therefore, disabled people can't even use the buses. And to me, that's ridiculous. Most taxi drivers aren't CRB checked. Meaning, we don't know if they're safe. Do you really want a young person getting in a taxi of someone or man or woman who you don't think is safe? Because personally, I don't think I'd want my son or daughter getting in a taxi of someone who isn't safe. Finally, us 16-year-olds are forced to pay an adult ticket on a bus to work, yet we work for a children's wage. It is our job as NYPs to just attend, to attend education and therefore, because we're forced to go to education, we're made to pay to go to education. Isn't that wrong? It is our job as NYPs to distinguish between what young people want and what young people need. And cheaper, better transport, I feel, is something that young people need. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Does anybody from Scotland want to take part in this debate? Yes, the young gentleman here, please. Taylor Mayor, uh, Mid Scotland and Fife. Now, a lot of you will know Stagecoach. Their headquarters is in my hometown, Perth, at the heart of Scotland. About six months ago, they introduced a system which gave a day rider of, for £1.90 to travel around the city. Well, that lasted for as little as three weeks. And then Sir Brian Souter, whose company 
earns hundreds of millions of pounds a year, but does not want to subsidise. Also, with Scott Rail just being bought over by a belly or network rail, I feel if there was reduced train fares and if all young people had the opportunity, then like my fellow colleague in the North West wouldn't have to pay £650 a year because that is absurd that the government will not fund for young people to travel around and that stops young people to have the opportunity to expand their viewpoint and maybe get involved with politics. So please support this motion. Support votes at 16. But if people can't use transport, they can't transport to the polling stations to vote. Oh, who from London wants to take part? Yes, young woman holding the exercise book. Thank you. Um, I'm Janella Womoyi and I represent the London Borough of Croydon. Two days ago, a tram derailed, taking the lives of seven innocent people. The first victim to be identified was a young teenager just one year older than me. Hearing about this instantly struck a chord. It is a method of transport that I regularly take and lots of my friends and family regularly use. Trams should be fitted with safety protection systems to apply, to apply brakes automatically if they're going too fast. Lives are too precious to be lost in such a way. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. What about Yorkshire and Humberside? Yes, there's somebody right at the back, second from the end, holding some sort of... Yes, and now looking... Yeah. Stand up again. Stand up again, second from the end. Yes, with the red tie. Thank you. Speaker, I'd like to respond to my friend from Liverpool and my friend from the South West Point. I'd like to congratulate my friend from Liverpool on her My Ticket campaign and the people of Liverpool. <laughs> but that is totally different. That, to <laughs> that is completely different from my friend in the South West. £650 to pay to go to college, which is essential for your future, is an absolute disgrace. But can we really do anything nationally? Personally, my bus fare for college is £190 a year. That is a significant difference. But that is a devolved issue. Like we talked about the NHS earlier, every local area is different. With transport, it, nationally it's just not viable, feasible and achievable. And instead, shouldn't we be having casual youth debates about curriculum for life, politics, votes at 16, anything else? I plead with you not to support this motion and support curriculum for life. Thank you. Thank you. What about a contributor from Northern Ireland? Is there a would-be contributor from Northern Ireland? Yes, the gentleman there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Ben Sharkey from Lagan Valley. I 100% support this motion. Past even the financial aspect of helping young people and students, I believe it helps us all in that it has great environmental benefits as well. More people using a better infrastructure of public transport will lead to a cut down emissions from private vehicles, which benefits the entire world. Which is, so that is why I believe everyone should support this. Furthermore, we can't just say for every issue, can we do this in a year? We have to go into this optimistic. We owe that to our constituents. Ooh. Very much indeed. What about the east of England? Who do we have from the east of England? Yes, y yourself. Me? Please. OK, thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm Megan Day, representative of Mid-Suffolk. Today I talk not just on behalf of the young people. I talk on behalf of our home, our planet and our environment. We, I don't need to stand here and lecture you all on the dangers of air pollution and global warming. I think you all know that already. But what I do want to bring to all of your attention is that Britain's carbon emissions, 25% of that is taken by transport. Did you know that one full bus can take up to 50 cars off of the road? And did you know that up to one full train can take up to 600? Mid Suffolk, the area I'm representing, is very rural and very isolated. The, the public transport there is irregular and expensive. How can we expect to reduce our carbon footprint if there are no alternatives? Something needs to be done. Something can be done, and that something can be us. Thank you. What about the southeast of England? Who do we have from the southeast? You've been trying for a while. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm Anna Fawaz from Slough. It is all good and well to get young people off the streets and to provide positive activities. It is no use and if young people cannot afford to get there. Although Transport for London has concessions for young people, this is not the case nationwide. If we had a national concession for young people, it would make transport, it would, it would allow transport to be cheaper and accessible for all. If, and more young people would use it. It would reduce no, numbers of cars off the road and contribute to a greener society. And of course, stop the taxi service of mum and dad. Recent legislation expects young people in education till they are 18. Why are we charging them adult fares when they are only 16 and making it unaffordable to attend colleges, internships, apprenticeships and other volunteering opportunities? I urge you all to vote for this motion because I get a taxi nearly every day after school and I do not feel safe. I do not feel safe getting just from school back to home, which only takes five minutes. This should not be the way forward. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. What about e East Midlands? Who do we have from the East Midlands? Yes, the young woman there. Indeed. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My name is Nishat Tamara and I'm the MYP for Leicestershire. I would just like to say, why is it that when, when you become 18, you can drink, you can smoke, you can take a mortgage, you can do whatever you want to do? Why is that? Because you are classed as an adult. Whereas when you are 16, you have so much responsibility. I go to work, I go to college. I'm here today speaking as a representative. I can say I do all of that, yet I am still treated like a child. I find this very discrimin discriminatory and unfair. How can you treat someone like this? You can't. I have to get the bus, at not one, but two, to get to the college that I chose to go to. You come into education and have to be there up until the age of 18. You should have a choice as to where you would like to go in your constituency or even outside of your constituency. You should be able to go there and know that it is at a lower fare that you can afford and your family can afford. So why is it that it is unfair and you are paying such an expense that actually you may choose not to go into education because you are not just providing for yourself, but for your family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, what about the northeast of England? Who do we have from the northeast of England? Gosh, it's a toss-up. We'll take you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm Thomas Crawford, and I've got the pleasure of representing the young people of Sunderland. Um, I've heard brilliant um, explanations as to why we should completely back this motion and I 100% agree with every single one of them, whether it's on the issues of age or the environment. Um, I would like to make a few comments on the practicalities of the motion. You know, people say that this is ambitious, but is it not ambitious to do everything that we do? To secure debates in this very chamber and sit on these very green benches, that was ambitious and we never thought it would pay off. And then when it did, the payoff was even bigger. Our local campaigns, we have doubts, but one day pay off. The, more, um, the bigger the doubts, the bigger the payoff. I would urge everyone to back this campaign and do not let the word ambition put us off, only to encourage us even further. Thank you. Now, members of the Youth Parliament, we actually have two front bench contributors in this debate from the North West. But if there is a backbencher who is thirsting to contribute, Yes, the woman who is waving at me, she's got a sort of purple, or sort of burgundy colour top. Yes, your good self. Very. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My name is Lucia Harrington, and I represent South Cumbria. Making transport accessible for all people is an important issue, especially in regards to transport provision for post-16 learners. As there is no such statutory concessionary travel scheme for students in full-time education, many students have to pay a vast amount of money to be able to attend their sixth form or college. Train fares are particularly expensive and there is very little support put in place for people who cannot um, afford these services. This particularly affects young people in rural areas because they usually have to travel further to get to school or college. For example, it will cost around £1,000 for me to attend sixth form this year. 
Luckily, I have a family who can pay for my travel costs, but there are some students who can't. For example, a friend of mine has to work long hours after school just so she can afford to get to sick form. And this is wrong. If the government wants us to stay in education until we're 18, then they should provide the means for us to get to the schools we want and have worked very hard to get into. Anybody else from London wishing to contribute? Yes, yes. Uh, what about the gentleman in the back row? Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name's Hamza Tolzan, and I'm the member of Youth Parliament for Westminster. So, welcome, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm really sorry for my counterparts across the room who have to pay such a ridiculous amount of money to actually just get an education, to go to college, to actually do things which should essentially be free. And from London, me from London, I live in probably the most, the best zone to live in, zone one. So I only pay about one pound thirty to get from, I guess, anywhere in London. I'm privileged in that sense. And in terms of going to college and going to school, I'm also privileged to walk it to school because I live about five minutes from my school. But I think it's ridiculous to say that we should not campaign for lowering trans um, weight pay costs for transport. Because essentially, as soon as that, like my friend over there said, doubt creeps into our mind, everything fails. Doubt is the hell which we go through every day. People doubted that we won't be able to make it here. People doubted that we'll be successful in our lives. But here we are here. What I want to say and want to urge people is don't let doubt overtake you. We are stronger than that and we are better than that. We, young, we are the young people who in the future will be successful. We will make our country greater than it's ever been. We are the future and just when doubt hits you, just tell it to go away. Tell it to see you another day. Like, not today, just get rid of it. At the end of the day, we are the best people we can possibly be, and we want the best for our country. Thank you. Thank you. Now, to conclude the final debate of the morning, I ask you warmly to welcome from the northwest of England, Lucy Boardman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Every single day, Hundreds of thousands of young people up and down the country start their morning with public transport. From the north to the south and everywhere in between. The lights flash, the engine revs and we begin our journeys to school, college and work. But are these young people getting services of a high standard at an affordable price? If not, what can we as a youth parliament do about it? We could make a real impact at a local level. We can put pressure on transport companies to run services more often, lower prices and engage with young people to help shape these services. However, nationally, are the government really going to commit to greater public transport concessions, particularly in the current economic climate? Could we really make a difference in the 12 months that we have? Since young people are now legally required to remain in some form of full-time education until they're 18, it seems logical that young people's transport concessions are extended accordingly. But money doesn't grow on trees, so which other services would need to be cut in order to fund this? Yes, we've campaigned on this issue before, but there is still so much more to be done. In 2012, the Youth Select Committee found that the cost of public transport fares was a key issue for young people. And clearly, it remains so. When we asked almost a million young people which topic was the most important to them, over 120,000 of them voted for transport. However, there were already other pressure groups working solely on this issue. The campaign for better transport is already well established and making progress. So perhaps we should invest both our time and our resources into an alternative topic, one that might be more achievable and produce better results. For those with a disability, public transport is often a difficult and inaccessible mode of travel. For those in rural areas, buses can be infrequent or don't arrive at all. It's clear something needs to change. But is the same change needed in every area? Transport in Durham is very different to that of Derbyshire, which is again different to that of Devon. Can we tackle this issue on a national scale, 
or should we be making it a local priority instead? In the end, it's up to you. We could turn our attention elsewhere, ready to accept a new challenge and tackle a new issue. Or we could spend another year campaigning for better, more affordable and more accessible transport, building on the progress we've already made to help bring about a positive change in the lives of every young person we represent. So, do you want to get off the train and change platforms or keep the engine running and finish the journey? Lucy, thank you very much indeed for that excellent wind-up speech in the debate. Just before I tell you that we're concluding the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge the very welcome presence of the Clerk of the House, the most senior officer of the House, David Nartsler. I referred earlier to Dr John Benger, who is Clerk Assistant. David Nartsler is our Clerk. He's been in the service of the House for over... He's not very old, but he's been in the service of the House for over 40 years and he sits at that table in front of me every sitting day when I'm in this chair. So our cooperation is of the highest importance. And David, thank you for your interest and support. Members of the Youth Parliament, that concludes the morning session of our sitting. The Youth Parliament will now adjourn until 1.30pm, and I invite you all, please, to return to Westminster Hall for lunch. Order, order. <laughs>